Our next speaker today is Brandon Ionata from the StructSoft. He's a senior director there. Immersed from a young age in the built environment through his family's construction business, Brandon has leveraged that life experience into his professional career at StructSoft over the last 11 years. An expert in enabling customers to bridge the gap between design and manufacturing, Brandon leads the StructSoft team as they push the boundaries of 3D BIM workflows, development of Revit add-ons, and bespoke custom programming projects for wood and light steel framing. Brandon is a family man and father to his two-year-old little girl and stays connected to his hands-on roots through hunting, fishing, and restoring vintage Harley Davidsons in his spare time. Please welcome Brandon Ionata. So uh, good morning and thank you for the introduction. Uh, thank you, uh, Dave, um, for uh, starting this off or kicking this off for us. Always a hard act to follow, uh, especially a guy out of the software side of things. Following a guy like Dave uh, is, a, is a tough one, so I'm going to do my best. Hopefully everybody bears with me a little bit. Um, fantastic turnaround. I really have to thank uh, Howick. We've been excellent partners over the last uh, almost as long as I've been at Strugsoft uh, for the opportunity to speak to everyone here today. So today I want to talk to you a little bit about BIM in the workshop. It's something that we focus on very much at uh, Strucksoft, and I'm particularly going to be discussing how software plays a major role in this ecosystem of prefab industrialized construction and how things are changing with the adoption, or how things have changed, I should say, with the adoption of tools like Revit in the industrialized construction industry. Uh, obviously, you know, Revit is not a tool that we would immediately assume uh, is a fabrication tool tool, but you know, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about how it is and how it's being employed today uh, in the industry. Um, so before I go too far, I want to just give you a little bit of background about uh, our company, Strucksoft, and the company that we've become over the last few years. Uh, as mentioned, I've been involved with Strucksoft for over a, de a decade, and uh, the company really started out as a small reseller uh, based out of Montreal, where I'm from. Um, and we first provided software services and customization as well as the software itself um, for this industry by way of HSB CAD and uh, ProSteel. So back in 2007, we started our development journey of developing uh, what we believe is uh, the first commercialized Revit plugin uh, called uh, MWF or Metalwood Framer. And uh, Amy uh, Marks mentioned that she had actually purchased one of the first versions and had to install it from a, a floppy disk uh, back in the day. So uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a great piece of history, I think. If I get my hands on that floppy disk, I'd be something we'll put it in the yeah put it up on the wall um in any case mwf is an automated light steel and wood framing tool um for revit okay and uh since we've uh, since then we've basically been focusing primarily on improving mwf uh building our user base um, as well as building customized software solutions around mwf and revit so you can imagine that this has kind of brought us into many accounts where clients were either uh, starting to assemble the necessary parts and pieces for uh, prefabrication or industrial, industrialized construction, or other accounts who have already been uh, through that process and are really seeing uh, a deficiency in the software that they're currently using. So they needed help in uh, you know, modernizing. So uh, now a little over two years ago, we were acquired by Graytech, one of the top five Autodesk resellers globally. And it's been an excellent match because at its nucleus, Graytech is actually a software developer, first having um, developed advanced steel and then advanced design. So the collaboration has really bol bolstered the Strucksoft business uh, and been able to uh, help us provide better services and better solutions to our customers in the uh, industrialized construction industry, as well as really leverage their experience in uh, engineering uh, and analysis of structures. So hopefully we're gonna see you know, full, uh, complete um, light gauge steel uh, structural analysis in Revit sooner than later. So um, we'll get back to what I really want to talk about, which is uh, kind of Revit as a data source, as a fabrication tool for this industry. So at Strucksoft, we recognize very, very early on the power of Revit. 
okay? Uh, specifically, parts of Revit that are crucial to using this platform as a basis for ma manufacturing or, fa or fabrication. So the most important in my mind is the precision that Revit uh, basically is built into Revit. Um, now, even though a lot of people using Revit do not fully embrace the precision of Revit, um, it's there and it's perfect venue for fabrication uh, where precision is key. So as most of the people in this audience know, all the precise data can be built into families relating all matter of material properties um, and of course accurate uh, you know, dimensions, engineering um, aspects of those uh, studs for instance, uh, the steel that we're using for the Howick machine, um, as well as weights and materials so that we can look at how things are affected downstream. Um, so all of this information is contained within the Revit project, which we look at as programmers as a massive database for which we can basically build software to call on each, each bit of that data and manipulate to produce very, very precise machine code um, to automate manufacturing through machines like Howix. Um, as well as uh, assembly machines, which are you know, going to help us put together those panels downstream. So how does it work? Um, obviously, this is a very simplified workflow to how things actually work, but let's use it as, a, as a, you know, the, the premise for this discussion. You know, models are never 100% precise, and I hear this all the time from all of our customers. They're getting something from an architect, and it's, it's barely usable from a fabrication standpoint. Um, so we need to accept that we're going to see these workarounds and we're going to see plain bad drafting uh, in the industry. However, you know, through trial and error, we've seen that this workflow is, 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 a, is one that works day in, day out for most of our customers. The first part of this is to take that source data and to create what I call a structural model. So a structural model is where we really start to clean up the model. We uh, build in that precision, precision excuse me, into our structural model. Now the power of Revit obviously is that it's a sandbox and we can link in our structural model to um, that architectural model for uh, clash detection and all the, you know, those fancy buzzwords that we hear all the time. But these are fantastic tools for the fabricator uh, to use. So we're able to essentially um, pull out all of that data and send it downstream. Next part is um, creating the fabrication model or the framing model. Sometimes the um, structural model and the fabrication model are uh, one and the same. Uh, and it also varies depending on what our end product um, you know, could be. Frame wall panels, uh, not to put anyone down, is probably one of the more simplistic outputs that we're seeing today. Um, obviously, we start talking about wall panels which are fully enclosed, including all manner of uh, you know, interior things such as uh, insulation, vapor barrier, but also MEP. Um, and of course, we're also looking at volumetric outputs, right? So uh, I'll talk more about the uh, shop documentation and fabrication aspects of this a little bit later as we get a bit further into the discussion. Um, so let's discuss the precision for a moment, okay? In the world of fabrication, this takes on a, an extremely different meaning. Uh, we understand that the precision of these machi machines is far greater than your typical construction tolerances. Uh, we're talking, you know, millimeter precision, uh, but also far greater than obviously your typical precision found in your day-to-day uh, -day Revit model. Uh, so it's a huge benefit. Um, but uh, we have to be careful that this uh, it can become an issue essentially uh, down the road if we do not pay attention to our source data. Again, that source data is Revit. Revit is a data source. Uh, it can be super precise. So um, really, it makes no sense to be exporting, excuse me, this data to additional sources. You know, we want to use the Revit sandbox, and uh, we advocate, you know, doing this level of, 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 of detail, this level of framing directly in the uh, Revit uh, model. You know, this is why we advocate, you know, uh, framing in, in Revit. If you see, you see a little bit of a clip of a model here. Obviously, a very complex model with, um, you know, hangers for MEP, obviously multiple collisions uh, in there, as well as through wall MEP, which is all stuff that we want to see downstream in the fabrication model. So the question becomes, how do we translate this information to the shop? There's several ways that we do this. Um, and the other question is, do the people in the shop or managing the shop need access to the Revit model? So 
Uh, it, it's a really good question. Uh, the answer a few years ago might have been yes uh, to some degree, but um, you know we'll see how software has really changed that made that idea a little bit obsolete. Um, so there are obvious and less obvious ways that we're sending data to the shop. Obviously, you know, paper is, is still king. Uh, we're sending over um, you know shop drawings. It's an integral integral part of what we do. Um, but less obvious uh, ways are layer, laser um, layout tables. So Dave's presentation, he showed us Vertec lasers. This is one that's widely used. You see this a lot in trust shops, but you're starting to see it more and more for panel layout tables and so on. Um, and then clients are starting to become more and more interested about leveraging this data downstream. So of course, we're seeing QR tagging and even RFIDs being used to kind of track production all the way out to final delivery. So back to shop drawings or panel tickets, uh, it's, it's really a necessary part of the puzzle, okay? Uh, and this is where historically most companies are putting the most time. So what we've done is really thought of ways to automate the creation of this directly in the Revit model because this is a really important part for um, our ability to clash detect as well as you know, start to develop the data necessary for fabrication. So uh, nothing glamorous about a 2D drawing. Uh, like I said, super necessary. The ability to create one of these every part of the panel uh, is, is really, really important. You can see some of the detail that we have in this model from dimensioning all the way out to a full bill of materials for every portion of that panel. Um, I don't have any examples of it, but if you have sheathing, MEP like we have in this one, all of this information is placed in the model. And what's really nice is it's all parametric. It's all parametric, it's all live, the data lives in the Revit model. This becomes our source of truth for our fabrication project. So here's where things really start to get interesting, I find. Uh, and uh, so I guess as we begin to take on more offsite builders as customers uh, and as partners, we started to see that some of the data that is super critical to the shop or to the offsite builder just wasn't important for the Revit model. So in some cases, it could slow down a model, for instance, uh, to the point of being super cumbersome. Um, I'm thinking specifically of instances of routing lines if you're cutting sheathing, glue lines if you're gluing that sheathing down to your panel. This type of information does not have any bearing on a Revit model. It simply does not be belong there. But we've seen these things in Revit models so that we can output that data to the machinery. So we started to think of ways to pull this data away from Revit um, since it has no real value. At the same time, uh, you know, we're starting to see cloud services become relevant in our, in our industry. So with the help of a few customers, um, what we did is start to bridge the gap between Revit and manufacturing output. And uh, what we found that you know, while digging into this, a lot of companies were using Excel spreadsheets to manage things like roll orders, sequencing, and even stacking. And it all influences how we build and the, the, uh, you know, the process of the manufacturing. So users wanted to have access to this 3D model. They didn't necessarily have the people that had the skills at the shop level to manipulate Revit. So we decided to build a platform for them where we can do all of this management and we can do all of this, um, this output from uh, a model that is directly related to um, our Revit model and is as precise. So again, this is all database driven. So at the top screen, you see basically a, a good example of a structure that's being sequenced for manufacturing and for construction. Green panels have been sequenced, red panels are not yet sequenced in this particular example. And the sequencing, what does that do? It then flows into the stacking. Stacking of the panels for delivery on uh, trucks is all managed from this cloud platform. So we're able to uh, basically very easily um, do this workflow all with Revit data essentially um, in, a, in a cloud environment that is um, outside of the Revit environment. What's super important here to understand um, if you're new to uh, fabrication or, or, or roll forming is that this is the step before fabrication. This decides in what order you're going to be uh, manufacturing. So if you weren't able to do this previously, you were kind of struggling using Excel spreadsheets. Finally, 
one of the missing portions of this was the ability to edit data, uh, specific manufacturing data um, at the CNC level. Um, so on the right, we see the editing tool that we've created, again, cloud-based, so it's accessible by any browser. And what you're seeing are all these little spots and lines on, on, on the representation of the panel. And these are, this is literally CNC code here. This is the 3D version of the CNC code. So you can imagine if you have a Revit, a Revit project of maybe a thousand wall panels and you wanted to put in each one of those uh, little dots and lines representing the code, it would become almost unusable. So um, we noticed that, you know, we had to figure out a way to give the user the ab ability to change these CNC operations in 3D outside of the Revit model to keep things nice and light and flowing, um, while you know giving them the ability to to uh, basically check for errors. Because oftentimes, you know, a, a Revit project may have an error which generates an error in C CNC code, which if you aren't able to check it, or if you're only checking by looking at a CSV file, um, finding that error is going to be uh, next to impossible. So that becomes wasted material. So here we have a good example of you know, additional uh, software applications that are allowing us to, to, to eliminate that waste. Uh, for, uh, preparing for this, I called a few customers to get some, some rough figures about how they feel this process has improved what they're doing day to day. So 20% faster design to production. So what does that mean, design to production? Well, that means using Revit as our single source of truth without ever having to leave the Revit environment for creating that framing model. Now, I'm not asking them to, I didn't ask them to give me the benefits that they see uh, as far as collaboration and coordination is concerned. It's really just using the Revit model as a basis, framing within that Revit model, as opposed to other you know, software avenues where we had to frame outside of the Revit model and recreate the model before framing. 42% faster fabrication drawings. This is all about automating the uh, software, the ability to create those 2D uh, panel drawings, which are you know, completely unsexy and, and not technological, but completely necessary in any fab shop. 10% productivity savings uh, in project delivery. So this is really from managing the panel stacking, the roll orders, and the production sequencing uh, in that 3D environment I showed you before, as opposed to doing it in Excel. And uh, which was the case in most cases. And then really what's cool, 90% reduction of scrap panels. So I have to, you know, there's a little caveat to that. that this is really based on how many panels are being caught with errors before and how many panels were being caught with errors before. So uh, now, excuse me. So speaking with the customers, they would see, you know, on average, maybe about, you know, 3% of panels had some error at some point, so they would have to scrap material and start again. These were uncaught panels, obviously. Now they've been able to reduce that 3% um, by 90% because they have the ability to, in 3D to go into that panel and verify every single one of those uh, conditions present in the uh, project. Um, so that pretty much wraps it up for me if there are any questions. Uh, on the workflow slide, you have step number two where you made reference to the structural model. Yep. Is there a change from, I know that in a, this is the practical side of it. I know that we, when we're using your tool, we're, we're actually using an architectural Revit yep. template and not a structural template. Is it changing? Is it on the path to change? The reason I ask is I know that the only way we can integrate with robot and down the stream advanced steel is if we use the structural models. Right. So that's the, that's the question. Yeah. So in general, um, the architectural model, and no offense to any architects here, is not a valid model for the purpose of fabrication. <laughs> Amir is, is laughing at me right now. But for the purpose of fabrication, it, it just isn't. It's a basis. OK, we're looking at it as a design intent almost. Right. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a structural model around it for exactly this purpose, for the for the purpose of the fabrication model, but so that we can, you know, downstream these tools like robot and other things. You know, uh, I didn't talk much about it, but engineering analysis is a major part of, uh, you know, what we do and what we hope to move towards. Because there is a huge demand, not so much in North America, but in, in other places in the world where you know, that engineering is not outsourced, it's done in-house. So we need to provide that to those customers. Thank you. Thank you.